Well, good evening and welcome to the second of a series of four talks on the topic of creation and evolution. These meetings have been arranged by the Christians who meet at the Gospel Hall in Perth, uh, Scotland. Tonight's uh, subject is fossils and the flood. I hope you find it of interest. During the course of the meeting, we'll be looking at various fossils. We start off with a big word, uniformitarianism. Charles Lyell, a contemporary of Charles Darwin, uh, he published a book, Principles of Geology, and in the book he made an argument for gradualism, that is uniformitarianism, which simply means this. He believed that the Earth's surface had been shaped by the observable, present-day, slow geological processes. So the processes, that, the processes that we see operating in the physical world around us today are the same processes that have gone on indefinitely uh, way back into the millions of years. And it, the present is the key uh, to the past. I, I don't think Charles Lyell uh, conceived that uh, phrase, but it, was, it is a phrase that is associated with uniformitarianism. The present is the key to the past. What we see operating presently is the key that unlocks the past. It demanded vast aeons of time. It was a radical concept when Charles Lyell introduced it in 1830, because most geologists believe that the Earth's features had been formed by the catastrophe of Noah's flood, as described in the Bible. Catastrophism was gradually rejected been replaced by Lyell's theory. And Noah's flood became a joke, was consequently relegated to the scrap heap. It is only in recent years that geologists have come to acknowledge that many features on the Earth's crust can only be explained in the light of catastrophe. And these people would be called neo-catastrophists. And you'll see this in many a textbook, the geological column. And the Earth's surface is mapped out in these various uh, stratum. And they tell us that we see evolution in the rocks. Now there's Jurassic, we've all heard of that because of Jurassic Park, uh, 195 million years uh, ago or thereabouts, at the height of the age of the dinosaurs. Pleistocene, we have the first modern humans, and then we have the first monkeys, the Oligocene, the Eocene, first elephants, horses, bats, and rabbits, Cretaceous, the chalk period, the first mammals, Permian, mammal-like reptiles, Carboniferous, the coal age, amphibians, Devonian, the age of fish, the Silurian, first land plants, and then Cambrian, and in this, we find the explosion of life. Life forms suddenly appearing, the great explosion of life. So when we look at the fossils, we're going to learn two basic lessons. Number one, no intermediate forms. And secondly, rapid burial is required. So two lessons, no intermediate forms, and rapid burial is required. No intermediate forms. Well, exactly what is an intermediate form? Well, here we have the green lizard. The next picture, we see the standard macaw. And there they are side by side. And if the green lizard wanted to turn into the macaw, it would have to pass through various stages, one of which would be this. Of course, this is uh, just to add a, a touch of humour to the, uh, the talk. But, uh, you know, they tell us that fish became amphibians, amphibians became reptiles, reptiles became birds and mammals, and then mammals uh, evolved over the uh, alleged millions of years, bringing us to ape man, cave man, and until we ar arrive with uh, modern man and modern woman, the intermediate form. A letter to Colin. 
Dr. Colin Patterson was a senior paleontologist at the British Museum of Natural History in 1978. He published a book entitled Evolution. And of course, the, uh, the statue, uh, the figure there is Charles Darwin. He died in uh, 1882, I think it was. And um, he, he, Charles Darwin, we're going to see, he, he knew that the, the rocks presented a problem for his theory of evolution. That is the absence of uh, the in-between stages. But he reckoned that 100 years after his death, that the museums of the world would be so full of fossils that, that they would have all the intermediate forms that they needed to prove his theory. Anyhow, back to Colin Patterson's book. In the book, he invited comments from his readers. One reader, Luther Sunderland of New York, wrote asking him, Dr. Patterson, why have you not included in your book any examples of actual transitional forms, intermediate stages? And Dr. Patterson was very honest. He, he wrote back to Luther Sunderland, and he, he wrote, I fully agree with your comments and the lack of direct illustration of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any, fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. So I admire Dr. Patterson for his honesty here. This is virtually 100 years after the death of Darwin. And he's honest enough to, to admit that he hadn't put any transitions, any intermediate stages, any missing links in his book because he didn't know of any fossil or living. I think the word living is important because, you know, if evolution is going on, as they suggest, and even today, now, why don't we see the in-between stages uh, right now in 2020, living transitions? We might ask, where are they? Now, we said earlier, Charles Darwin knew that he had a problem. And in his book, The Origin of Species, a chapter, The Imperfections of the Geologic Record, he wrote, intermediate links, the in-between stages. Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic change. And this is perhaps the most obvious and serious objection which can be urged against the theory. So as we said earlier, Charles Darwin admitted that he had a problem with the rocks. They, they, they didn't present the intermediate stages uh, as uh, he would have, uh, as is required but convinced that 100 years after his death and the museums of the world would be uh, full of fossils, they certainly are full of fossils, and uh, he thought then they would have all the intermediate stages that they needed by this time. But Patterson, 1979 was it, uh, he was telling us that he, he a man who'd uh, spent his life studying fossils, could not uh, present uh, any transitional forms. Further, in Luther Sunderland's book, uh, Darwin's Enigma, he interviewed five of the world's leading paleontologists at that time. Dr. Colin Patterson from London, Niles Eldridge from uh, New York, David Pilbeam from Boston, and Dr. David Raup from Chicago, and Dr. Donald Fisher from the New York Natural History Museum. And on page 88 of his book, he said, none of the five museum officials could offer a single example of a transitional series of fossilized organisms that would document the transformation from one basically different type to another. And here's one of the five men, Dr. Niles Eldridge, curator in the Department of Invertebrates at the American Museum of Natural History. Malcolm Bowden and his book on November 21st, 1978. So here we are almost 100 years after Darwin's death. The Guardian reported a lecture given by Dr. Eldridge to the American Museum of Natural History. And Niles Eldridge said, the smooth transition from one form of life to another, which is implied in the theory, is not borne out by the facts. No one has ever yet found any evidence of such transitional, intermediate, in-between creatures. Geologists have found rock layers of all divisions 
of the last 500 million years and no transitional forms were contained in them. If it is not the fossil record which is incomplete, then it must be the theory. No transitional forms. Now, for example, they tell us that uh, fish became uh, amphibians, fish moved from the oceans or onto land and became amphibians. And this is a quote from the Encyclopedia of Reptiles and Amphibians, 1986. Although this transition doubtless occurred over a period of millions of years, there is no known fossil record of these stages. So the writer is telling us that he has no doubt that this change occurred. Fish turned into amphibians, but there is no known fossil record of these stages. I ask you, is that an objective conclusion or is it subjective? I would suggest to you it is the latter. You see, this quote, we'll come across it several times throughout the talk tonight. I wouldn't have seen it if I hadn't believed it. Normally we say, I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it. But because they're committed to the evolutionary worldview, they see it because they believe it. British Museum of Natural History. Let's meet Grandad. The fish that walked onto land. The coelacanth. Now I'm going to show the next few slides. Uh, there, it's taken from Richard Milton's book, The Facts of Life, and the chapter, The Fish That Walked. And it's all about the coelacanth. Milton writes, the British Museum of Natural History mounted a display and parties of school children pressed their noses against the hallowed glass cabinets of South Kensington in pursuit of merit marks from approving school teachers. Because the coelacanth was presented as a missing link, an, an intermediate form, a transitional form, said to be the father of terrestrial life. So take a good look at that fish because according to the uh, British Museum of, of Natural History, uh, that was your great, 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 and so on, grandfather, the father of terrestrial life. Milton writes, the fish and its relatives had flourished during the Devonian period, some 350 million years ago before declining to a dignified end. But before expiring, it had managed to flap onto the estuarine mud flaps uh, with the aid of its embryonic limbs and give birth to a hopeful new generation of creatures able to exploit the land. And so well might that fish say, my feet are killing me. And there we have it presented in its glass case and we see the embryonic limbs. And so the speculation was that those limbs were sufficient to bring it up onto the land and they became, over time, they became limb, legs and, uh, and feet with uh, and toes. The father of terrestrial life. Says Milton, truly a Columbus among marine organisms and a worthy progenitor of the human race. The announcement of the discovery of the missing link was one of Fleet Street's earliest scientific scoops. And though the readers of the popular dailies couldn't tell a coelacanth from a breakfast kipper, the public imagination was fired by the discovery. Until 1938, fishermen trawling the waters of East London on the coast of Africa in 1938 found a strange looking fish in their nets. The decomposing and by now highly aromatic uh, remains of the fish were identified as a living specimen of the coelacanth. 
it soon became evident that the coelacanth was a poor choice for the missing link between marine and terrestrial life. Its four fins are much like those of any other fish and are no more suitable for supporting its weight on land or giving rise to amphibious limbs than those of a fairground goldfish. There is too the awkward fact that the coelacanth lives at such great depths in the ocean, up to 200 meters, that it explodes. I take it that's its swim bladder. It explodes due to decompression when brought up to the surface, a slightly ticklish handicap for a colonizer of the land. And the children who came around and looked at the fish in its glass case, they swallowed the lie. When they were told the father of terrestrial life, you see, I wouldn't have seen it if I hadn't believed it. And then they tell us that reptiles turned into birds. Says uh, A. Fiducia, quite an authority on birds. Feathers are features unique to birds and there are no known intermediate structures between reptilian scales and feathers. Because in the mind of the, the evolutionist, the scales on the reptile frayed and became uh, feathers in uh, the birds. Well, let's put the a feather under a magnifying glass. The central shaft is the rachis. So it's, uh, it's going from, from uh, east to west, sloping up there. And we see that it's got north and south limbs on the rachis. They're called barbules. But um, if, we, if we look on the barbules, we'll see that heading out east and west on that limb, you've got uh, further limbs. And the limbs that head out to the, to the east, they would be curved. But the limbs that head out to the right, well, they're hooked. And then if you look there in the middle there, we've tried to emphasize it there, circled in red. You see how the, the hooks just, uh, curve round the, the curved limbs and uh, in, in effect make a zip. And, uh, you know, living very close to the coast, uh, we would often go down when we were boys to the coast and we would find seagulls uh, feathers and uh, we would pick them up fr from the beach and we used to enjoy uh, ripping them, literal, literally ripping them apart. You could tear the feathers apart and you could almost hear them rip. And then we would press them back together again. We don't know how it worked. And we would just press it with our, between our thumb and first finger. And for some reason, uh, what had been separated and now was joined up again. We didn't realize at the time it was just the hooks uh, zipping into the curved limbs. And uh, Philip Regal, he says, can you imagine the in-between stage of this? going from a scale to a feather. Indeed, the intermediate structure, the in-between stage, would result in a tangled mess, more like a briar patch than a contour uh, feather. That's what it would be, wouldn't it? Now, just look at that diagram there, the, the white diagram. We can see, really, it's, uh, it's uh, just as a zip as a, a wonderful piece of engineering, so too uh, the bird feather is. But the intermediate stage, hard to imagine it, says Philip Regal, it would be like a briar patch. And then they tell us that reptiles turned into mammals. Well, you've got at least four problems as I see it. Number one, how do you get scales turning into hair? You've got the same problem of turning scales into feathers. You know, a scale is a fold in the skin, but a hair sits in its own uh, follicle. How do you go from egg laying to live birth? And you need the mammary gland so that the offspring can suckle. And you're going to turn a cold-blooded creature into a warm-blooded creature. But 
you know, it happens in the minds of men. Now, these next few slides, they take me back to the time when I was uh, 11. And uh, I'll read the slide. In 1874, paleontologist, Professor Othniel Marsh spent his life studying fossils. He collected a magnificent set of American fossils, setting out, as he thought, the evolutionary development of the horse. Darwin thought Marsh's sequence from little Eohippus, that is dawn horse, to the modern horse was the best evolutionary demonstration anyone had produced in the 15 years since the publication of his book, The Origin of Species. A grand exhibition was staged at the American Museum of Natural History and Marsh's horse sequence became enshrined in every biology textbook. Now, as I said earlier, this takes me back to the time when I was 11. Obviously, we're going back way back in history and um, no televisions in schools in those days, but there were, there were radio programs. Now, I recall sitting with my 39 classmates every Friday morning, being made to look at the loudspeaker in the corner of the room by the teacher as if the, as if the loudspeaker was a television screen. And I still remember the name of the program. It was called How Things Began. It was all about evolution. Now, I didn't realize it at the time, but I was uh, being fed a lie that day, along with my 39 uh, classmates. And I still remember one of the programs that was this, the, de the evolutionary development of the horse from little Eohippus, dawn horse, to the modern day horse. Misleading. This is a quote from the Encyclopedia of Evolution by Richard Milner. The exhibit is now hidden from public view as an outdated embarrassment. Almost a century later, paleontologist George Gaylord Simpson re-examined horse evolution and concluded that generations of students had been misled. Misled. Me, as 11-year-old, misled. Now, this is serious stuff. But generations, I, I'm one of 40 children who listen to that program j just in, uh, up here in the northeast of England. And how many thousands of children throughout the country swallowed this a lie? And the children swallowed the lie. Niles Eldridge again. There have been an awful lot of stories, some more imaginative than others, about what the nature of that history of life really is. The most famous example still on exhibit downstairs is the exhibit on horse evolution prepared 50 years ago. That has been presented as the literal truth in textbook after textbook. Now I think that that, that is lamentable, particularly when the people who propose those kinds of stories may themselves be aware of the speculative nature of some of that stuff. Lamentable, he says. Lamentable. And take a look at this word speculation speculation it's not an objective appraisal of, of, of the uh, of the facts before the paleontologist it's because they are committed to a worldview that says there is no god and uh, evolution is indeed a fact you see i wouldn't have seen it if i hadn't uh, believed it another example of this being true uh, Dr. Michael Denton, uh, he wrote a book, Evolution, A Theory in Crisis, in which he said, without intermediates or transitional forms, the in-between stages, to bridge the enormous gaps which separate existing species and groups of organisms, the concept of evolution could never be taken seriously as a scientific hypothesis. What he's saying is that if you have not got the in-between stages, well, evolution can never be taken seriously as a scientific hypothesis. Back to Luther Sunderland's book. Dr. Patterson spoke most freely about the absence of transitional forms. If you ask what is the evidence for continuity, you'd have to say there isn't any in the fossils of animals and man. The connection between them is in the mind. Now that's a telling phrase, isn't it? Evolution happens not in the rocks, but in the minds of men. 
John Blanchard, he wrote a, a small booklet, Evolution, Fact or Fiction, and he quotes L.T. Moore. The more one studies paleontology, that is the fossils, the more certain one becomes that evolution is based on faith alone. Evolution is a faith. Just as my belief in Jesus Christ as saviour, the one who left the throne to die in a cross and rose again the third day. I, I, I trusted him 48 years ago. And that was a real thing. And in the quietness of my own bedroom, it was a step of faith. But the evolutionist too, he has faith. He's committed to fish turning into amphibians and amphibians into reptiles and, and so on and so on. Dr. Duane Gish, he wrote a book, Evolution, the Fossils Still Say No. He says on page 49, the fossil record, rather than being a record of transformation, is a record of mass destruction, death and burial by water and its contained sediments. Just let's spend a little time looking at that statement. You see, the evolutionists would tell us that we see evolution in the rocks and the fossils. But as we've seen from the various people already quoted that uh, there are no transitional forms. And if uh, Dr. Michael Denton is to believe, then we cannot take evolution seriously as a scientific uh, hypothesis. And doc Dr. Dwayne Gish here is saying it, the, the fossils do not give a record. It's not a record of transformation, but it is a record of something. It is a record of mass destruction, death and burial by water and its contained sediments. Well, how are fossils formed? Now, this is from the BBC uh, website. Fossilization only happens in the rarest of cases. The trick to becoming a fossil is to die in a location where your body is protected from scavengers and the elements, and this means getting buried in sand, soil or mud, and the best place uh, for that is on the seabed or a riverbed. And they illustrate it like this. You know, a creature goes down to a, a, a riverbed uh, uh, to, to lap some water up. Uh, he's in a weak condition. He dies by the side of the river, expires, and then he's covered by water and, and the sediment contained in that water. And he becomes locked into uh, that layer of, let's say, sandstone. And then the layers build up over the passing of millennia. And then more layers build up. And then in the process of time, uh, the, the landscape is weathered. It's eroded away and various parts of fossils are, are exposed. And the fossil hunter comes along with his uh, little hammer and he chips away and he finds the fossils. We're going to see a number of fossils. So th this is how it's presented, you know, by, by a river, a creature dies, and well, we're going to see that that's not quite the case. Tommy the teacher, fossils. Now these next few slides are based on something that, that happened to me. I was in the south of England and I'd been invited into a junior school, a church school in the south of England, to take morning assembly. The school only had 45 pupils in it, and there was no school hall. Uh, the classrooms had to double up as a school hall. And so I arrived there early with my equipment to set up ready for the assembly. And there was a lesson going on in the classroom in which I was to take assembly as I was setting up. And the teacher sat at the table surrounded by 12, 12 pupils or so. And uh, I couldn't believe it. She said, well, today, children, we're going to learn about fossils. And this is what, these slides are what happened in the course of that lesson. The teacher said, boys and girls, when a fish dies, it sinks to the bottom of the stream, lake or ocean. As it lies there, it gradually gets covered with small particles of sediment carried by the water. Eventually, as time passes, the layers of sediment build up and the fish becomes a fossil. Now, as I say, this really happened. And as the teacher said that, a little girl, let's call her Gloria, 
she put her hand up and she said, Sir, my goldfish, Je Jeffrey, uh, died last week. But he didn't sink. He just floated on the top. I, I, I heard this with my own ears. And it just confirms it to me. Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, says the scripture. Now, we're going to travel uh, around the world and we're going to look at some interesting uh, uh, fossils. There's a, a, an ichthyosaur and a museum, Stuttgart in, in Germany. And uh, there's a female ichthyosaur. Ichthyosaurus. Now, how do I know it's a female? Well, because it was fossilized in the process of giving birth. And there is one of her offspring leaving the birth passage, coming out into the ocean world, but never making it. Because before that could happen, it was buried by sediment contained in water and locked into the fossil record to be found years later by the fossil hunters. So there is a creature that was fossilized in the process of giving birth. And from the same area, the Solnhofen limestones, a flying reptile. Look at the fine bones, look at the skull of the bird. There's a shrimp, no difference, if any, between the modern shrimp. And then still in Germany, the Messel Pit, 2012. According to Wiki, nine mating pairs of fossil turtles have been found. So we've had a creature that was fossilized in the process of giving birth. We have nine mating pairs. There were nine male and female turtles caught in the very act. And they were, they were locked into the sedimentary layers, inundated by water and the sediment it contained. Nine mating pairs of fossil turtles have been found. Dragonflies from the same limestones. Look at the detail there. Canada, while on the subject of dragonflies. Look at the fossil, look at the drawing beneath. Even the fine veins within that fossil, the dragonfly wing is captured in the, the limestone. Still in Canada, a bird found in the Ottawa Museum of Nature. The Czech Republic fossilized frog, a Czech frog. In fact, we could say it's a flat Czech frog. USA, many of these mammoth from Illinois. And how do you fossilize a creature that big? If, if it dies, then the scavengers come along and break it up into its various pieces and go back two or three months later and there's nothing left. Perhaps just a few bones. There's the Smilodon, or as we would say, the saber-toothed tiger, California. And there's the artist's impression of the creature. Interesting, fossilized raindrops. They, they have to be covered instantly. Otherwise, they're just ruined. But look, look you even see the shape and see the splash marks. And this one is called a uh, Zephactinus, Kansas Museum. It's 13 feet long, that creature, and it's just swallowed uh, a Gillicus arcutus. So the creature inside its body hasn't been digested yet. In fact, it's just been swallowed. And that's probably just a little smaller than a human, the creature inside its, its belly. 
So one, one moment he's, he sees small fry ahead, swallows it, and uh, before he can even start to digest it, he's covered by sediment and the water that holds the sediment. And there's the artist's impression of that event. So what one moment he's up, got his mouth opened and he's swallowed the prey. And the next moment he's locked into the sedimentary layer to become a fossil, to be dug up years later by the fossil hunter. Let's go back to USA. Uh, look at the feather features there of this bird in Wyoming. There's a bat, five and a half inches, Wyoming. A fish with a half finished meal. So the, the, the giant that we looked at before, the Xyphactinus, uh, he is a, a smaller fish eating a smaller fish. But before we can get it down into its gullet, it's covered by sediment and locked into the fossil layers. From the same area, a fossil horse, Wyoming. See the fish? Same place, a turtle, 1.7 meters. That's what, six foot, six foot long. Too soft to fossilize. Can you think of a creature that's too soft to fossilize? There are many examples of this, by the way. Jellyfish, how do you fossilize a jellyfish? As I said earlier, I, I live by the coast and it wouldn't be unusual perhaps in the summer to go down to the, the coast and walk along the shoreline and you might see a stranded uh, jellyfish. It's been washed up and go back the next day. It's, it's not covered by sediment. It's certainly not halfway to becoming a fossil. It's nowhere to be found. It's been carried off back into the sea. An entire horde of jellyfish were found in central Wisconsin. January 2002. W. Hagedorn said these jellyfish are not just large for the Cambrian, but they're the largest jellyfish in the entire fossil record. Now this is not one jellyfish, this is a whole horde of them. Creatures that are at home in the sea and yet unindated by, by water and by the sediment that that water contained to be locked into the fossil record. New Zealand Since the discovery of the first moorbones in the late 1830s, thousands more have been found. There's the artist's impression. Up to three meters tall. The UK. This was on the BBC website, 2009, writing with Jurassic Inc. British paleontologists have found the perfectly preserved squid and squid ink sack in Jurassic rocks in Wiltshire, England. The rocks were dated at 150 million years. Paleontologists have drawn with the ink that was extracted from a preserved fossilized squid uncovered during a dig in Trowbridge, Wiltshire. So they found this fossilized squid, but the, the ink sac, it, it wasn't squa squashed. It, it had been preserved in, in three dimensions. And they could, even, they could even extract the ink from that sac and write with it. Dr. Phil Wilby said, it's difficult to imagine how you can have something as soft and sloppy as an ink sac fossilized in three dimensions, still black, and inside a rock that is 150 million years old. Perhaps the rock isn't 150 million years old. Surely one wouldn't be able to write with ink if it was that old. India, the Siwalik Hills in India, they are 2,000 to 3,000 feet high, several hundred miles long, actually the foothills uh, of the Himalayas. 
extraordinarily rich beds crammed with fossils, hundreds of feet of sediment packed with jumbled bones of scores of extinct species, including some 30 species of elephant. Many of the creatures are remarkable, including a tortoise 20 feet long. A species of elephant with tusks 14 feet long and three feet in circumference. So if there's anybody who was watching this video presentation and the trousers that you wear are a 36 inch waist, well, that is the, that is the circumference of the elephant's tusks. A huge creature. Other animals commonly found include pigs, rhinoceroses, apes, and oxen. This is no riverbed situation where the creature goes down for a drink and dies. No, they're gone for, uh, for, for miles and miles and miles, and these creatures are massive. Pakistan, look at this one. In Recothrian, there's a reconstruction of it. The largest land mammal in history. Clocked in at 20 feet tall, 30 feet long, and weighed some 20 tons. Dwarfed the, the elephants. Chili. See what we've got here? A fossilized uh, Rockwell whale from Cerro Bellina in Chile. Now, to give you an idea of the scale, there's one of the brushes that the archaeologists were using to brush it away. Same area, fossil Rockwell whale family, two adults and a juvenile. So you've got, got two adults and a juvenile who've died at the same time and become part of the fossil record. And there's a photo of the dig. And there's the, the highway. There's the road passing by. And there the, uh, the, the archaeologists, they're digging away and uh, sweeping away bit by bit the various uh, sedimentary rocks, and exposing the fossil of the, the whale. The site of La, La Familia, the family whales, was next to the Pan American Highway, 2011. Peru. In 1999, 346 fossilized whales were found within a one and a half square kilometer area, 200 miles south of the capital, Lima. This isn't one whale, it's not even a dozen whales. 346 whales. But this is interesting. The sedimentary rock that they were found in is called diatomite, said to be currently forming in the fjords of British Columbia at a rate of 2.5 to 5 millimeters per year. How can you fossilize 346 whales with a sedimentary rock that is said currently forming, now the present is the key to the past, as Charles Lyell would tell us, forming at the rate of two and a half to five millimeters per year. Now this is interesting. William Corliss, uh, he was a physicist and uh, he, he scoured the, the scientific uh, literature. Uh, he was looking for uh, an anomalies. He's got some excellent books and uh, one of them is Neglected Geological Anomalies. In 1976, workers in a diatomite quarry in California uncovered a fossilized baleen whale standing on its tail. Now, I don't think that's a baleen wheel, but I've used it for illustration purposes. And uh, it's fossilized in diatomite standing on its tail. It's 80 feet tall. Now, what is diatomite? It's a sedimentary rock made up of almost entirely from the skeletal remains 
of microscopic aquatic single-celled organisms called diatoms. So these microscopic creatures, they have a, a, a skeleton shell. And as they die, the shell is abandoned and falls to, to the, the, the base of the ocean and forms layers. As we've said, uh, 2.5 to 5 millimeters per year uh, is suggested. Now you ask yourself, well, that's 80 feet tall. How, how can a creature be fossilized on its tail? Uh, by, in this particular type of sedimentary rock, that forms so slowly. It takes millions of years, doesn't it? This deposit poses problems to uniformitarian ge geologists. This is what William Kohler suggested. He, he quotes from a magazine, Chemical and Engineering News, that, that this fossil generated some correspondence and here's the correspondence from Harvey Olney. Now, I, I think he's writing tongue in cheek. And Dr. Helmick, w w when he looked at this whale, he, he realized that uniformitarianism cannot explain it. And so Dr. Helmick is suggesting that perhaps the answer is outside of uniformitarianism. And so Harvey Olney wrote, Dr. Helmick, how dare you imply that our geology textbooks and uniformitarian theories could possibly be wrong? Everybody knows that diatomaceous earthbeds are built up slowly over millions of years as diatom skeletons slowly settle out on the ocean floor. The baleen whale simply stood on its tail for a hundred thousand years, its skeleton undecomposing, while the diatomaceous snow covered its frame millimeter by millimeter. As we say, he wrote that tongue in cheek. Certainly, you wouldn't expect intelligent and informed establishment scientists of this modern age to revert to the outmoded views of our forefathers just to explain such finds. We can't go back to catastrophism to explain this. We must hold on to uniformitarianism. Argentina, Dread Nordis. September 2014. At 85 feet long and weighing about 65 tons, Dreadnoughtus scrawny is the largest land animal for which a body mass can be accurately calculated. Its skeleton is exceptionally complete, with over 70% of the bones excluding the head represented. Dr. Kenneth Lakovara chose the name Dreadnoughtus because it just means fears nothing. Well, a creature as massive as that, you think, would fear nothing. Mongolia, new scientists, 2015 February, they will remain forever locked in mortal combat. In 1971, a Polish Mongolian team discovered in the white sandstone cliffs in the southern Gobi Desert, uh, a, velo a velociraptor and a protoceratops were battling with one another at the time of burial. So these land creatures, they were fighting one minute and the next thing you know, they were covered with sediment and locked into the white sandstone cliffs that would form in the Southern Gobi Desert. And then still in Mongolia, massive graveyard of parrot beak dinosaurs in Mongolia, 187 creatures. Well, how do you fossilize 187 bar uh, parrot beak dinosaurs? Bury them quickly, of course. It has the name parrot lizard because its muzzle resembles a parrot's beak, all found within an area of several square kilometers. USA, according to the Guardian, July 2019, perhaps the best dinosaur fossil ever discovered. 
in Montana, USA, 2006, fossil hunters unearthed the intertwined remains of a T-Rex and a Triceratops locked in a ferocious battle with one another. Two land creatures fighting one minute and the next minute inundated by, by water and the sediment that it contained to be, to be locked into the, uh, the lair, to be waiting for the time to pass and the fossil hunter to find them there in Montana, USA. Still in Montana, science, July 9, 1993. Now this is interesting, Mary Schweitzer, a graduate student at the Museum of the Rockies in Montana, was examining a thin section of Tyrannosaurus rex bone under the microscope when she noticed visible blood cells, even containing nuclei threaded throughout the bone. Mary Schweitzer, as she saw that, she said she got goosebumps. It was exactly like looking at a slice of modern bone. But of course, I couldn't believe it. The bones, after all, are 65 million years old. How could blood cells survive that long? Now, notice the change here. Mary Schweitzer is saying, I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it. She saw it with her own eyes, and because she saw it with her own eyes, she believed it. It was no different than, than, than looking at a slice through modern bone. And then we moved on some years from that find, and this is Science 2005, March 25th. A research team led by Mary Schweitzer of North Carolina State University has discovered the remarkable preservation of soft cellular tissue inside several T-Rex and other dinosaur bones. So it's not one off. They observed dinosaur blood vessels still flexible and elastic after 68 million years and apparently intact cells. Could I suggest to you that they're not 68 million years old? Schweitzer recounts how after that first discovery, she noticed that a T-Rex skeleton from Hell Creek in Montana had a distinctly ca cadaverous odor. It's the, the, the smell of death. So here she was, she was digging out a T-Rex skeleton and it had the smell, the odor of death. And when she mentioned this to longtime paleontologist Jack Horner, he said, oh yeah, all Hell Creek bones smell smell but there should be no smell if those millions of years have passed january 2013 radiocarbon and dino bones now radiocarbon it's uh it's it's good up to a hundred thousand years a team of researchers gave a presentation at the 2012 western pacific geophysics meeting in singapore and they gave carbon 14 dating results from many dinosaur samples from eight, eight, many bone samples from eight dinosaur specimens. All give dates ranging from 22,000 to 39,000 years. You see, you'd never carbon date a creature that was millions and millions of years because it wouldn't register. But they did that with, with these bones. And they were ranging from 22,000 to 39,000 years, right in the ballpark predicted by creations. Now you'd have to go on the website to see that their, their article about what they mean about this ballpark. But if the dinosaurs really were millions of years old, there should be not one atom of carbon-14 left in them. In the early 1980s, evolutionists unearthed some fossil remains in the 5.2 million years old sedimentary rocks in the Kulduna form formation in Pakistan. It was claimed that the fossil creature, which they named Pachycetus, showed how land mammals had progressively evolved into whales. Pachycetus. Pachycetus, which simply means whale from Pakistan, 
was described as the oldest fossil whale. The Journal of Ge Geological Education, 1983, March, featured a drawing of the creature on its cover. It showed a whale-like animal with half feet and half flippers. So there we are. Nebraska State Museum of Natural History. And there we have it. There's the creature. The, one of the intermediate stages between a land animal uh, and the whale. By the way, it's the size of a fox. Public signage said, a reconstruction of a fossil transitional whale from the Eocene period of, of Pakistan. The shaded area in the drawing to the right shows the actual parts discovered by the paleontologists. So the, the artist's impression is based purely upon the shaded area there. The rest of the skeleton was unknown until 2001, when they went back and uh, made further dig, digs and uh, more fossil remains of Pachycetus were found and it was reported in Nature, September 201, 20th of September. The creature looked nothing like the original construction. There it is now, the fossil remains. Like a fox, isn't it? And there's the image. It was a fox-sized animal with long slender legs, similar to those running of jumping mammals. It, it wasn't the so-called first whale. Off to the beach, well, back to the drawing board, Charles, because I'm certainly not an in-between stage. You see, evolution happens in the minds of men. It's another case of I wouldn't have seen it if I hadn't believed it. But because they're committed to this worldview that evolution is a fact and well, and you, you've got to have, you've got to have a land creature becoming by some means a, a, a whale. And well, and Pachycetus was labeled as the first, but it was a bad choice as we've seen. Interesting fossil from Scotland. Yeah, here's another fish having a meal. A fish feeling down in the mouth, and we could say that both fish had had their chips. One minute having a meal, before it can swallow it or get it down its gullet, it's inundated by sediment and the water that brings the sediment. Archaeopteryx. I was in a school in the northeast of England, uh, setting up to take morning assembly. I'd finished early, and uh, sorry, I'd finished setting up early, and uh, I was looking at the library books on the side of the hall. And there was a brand new spanking book, beautifully presented, lovely a photographic paper and Archaeopteryx, meaning ancient wing. This, this, this was one of the fossils from uh, uh, Solhofen uh, limestone area in Germany. And this is what the book said. The skeleton of Archaeopteryx, the first bird, is shown as it was found in the fine grained limestones of Solnhofen in southern Germany. Do you notice that? The first bird. So this is a fairly modern book and any child who picks that book off the shelf reads that statement, Archaeopteryx, the first bird. Then there's the artist's impression. The first bird, well nature 1986. An article titled Fossil Bird Shakes Evolutionary Hypothesis. Fossils of modern type birds have been found in rocks which are 75 million years older than Archie. So it's not the first bird, but will the children in that, in that South Tyneside school ever get to hear that? Here's an interesting one. At a press conference in Washington DC, October 99, National Geographic heralded an illegally exported fossil from the famous Liaoning deposits in China as being a true missing link in the complex chain that connects dinosaurs to birds. So they had a fossil 
that was the missing link between a dinosaur and a bird, just as, just as Archaeopteryx had been uh, said to be in that position earlier on. The fossil exhibited an avian body, a bird body, and a straight rigid tail associated with a fleet-footed dinosaur known as dromaeosaurs. So it had the tail of a, of a dinosaur and it had the body of a bird. Ha ha, so we have it. There's an intermediate stage, a missing link. In the following month, National Geographic, confident in the assertions of the experts, did a glossy write-up by senior editor Christopher Sloan. So you can actually go to this edition of National Geographic and you can read it for yourself. Article Feathers for T-Rex. However, it was soon exposed as a fraud. A Chinese farmer had glued the head and body of a bird to the tail and legs of a dromaeosaur dinosaur. He realized it would fetch a little bit more money. It was a hoax. The new scientists, I don't suppose they could uh, let this slip by. A chance to get a dig at arrival, perhaps. They called it the pilled down bird. A missing link in aviation was nothing of the sort. A fossil that appears to be a bird's body with a dinosaur tail has left some paleontologists with egg on their faces. You see, evolution happens in the minds of men. It's a case of I wouldn't have seen it if I hadn't believed it. Polystrate trees. You remember in the maths lesson at school, we looked at polygons. We found out that the word poly just means many. And so we've got fossilized trees that go through many strata, many layers of rock. And uh, that's from Joggins, North of Scotia. It's the, uh, from 1868. You can see the scale of the, the fossilized tree comparing it to the man. There's an actual tree from the Joggins uh, cliffs at Nova Scotia. You see, if that sediment is going to be laid down slowly, millimeter by millimeter, you know, two, two millimeters a year or whatever it is, well, the rest of the tree is it's going to rot away. It's, not, it's certainly not going to be entombed by the slow forming sedimentary rock. And this, this one here, Stanhope in the northeast of England, it's about 40 miles away from my home here. It's, it's in the churchyard. It was found in a nearby quarry, but it was brought uh, to form an, an, an exhibit here in the church. It's, it's on the front street there in Stanham. Llewellyn Formation, Pennsylvania, USA. There's a tree going through the various strata. Polystrate uh, Lycocard in Tennessee. Beautifully formed, isn't it? So this isn't the slow deposition of sediment, it's rapid burial, an interesting one. A group of coal miners around a petrified tree trump way down the mine in 1918. Now, as we've said that many geologists of, of today, they now concede that, that there are many features uh, in the Earth's crust that, that can only be understood in the light of catastrophe. Derek Ager, very well-known geologist, he wrote a book, The Nature of the Stratigraphical Record. In the late Carboniferous Coal Measures of Lancashire, a fossil tree has been found 38 feet high, still standing in its living position. Sedimentation must therefore have been fast enough to bury the tree and solidify before the tree had time to rot. How do you fossilize a tree that's 38 feet tall with slow forming sedimentary rock? Well, Derek Edger, he's, he's up to, uh, to telling us that uh, burial had to be rapid. And then in the same book, he quotes uh, Gilboa in New York State, a whole forest of in situ Devonian trees, 40 feet high, 
not an isolated tree, but a whole forest. Remember the layer that uh, we find the explosion of life. We find in abundance this particular creature, the trilobite, comes in various forms. There's a wonderful picture of the trilobite eye. Dr. Kurt Wise, uh, himself a creationist, uh, a paleontologist, he says the design of the schizocrawl eye makes it unique amongst eyes, perhaps even to the point of being the best optical system known in the biological world. And yet we find it way back at the explosion of life. There can be up to 700 lenses making up that complex eye, compound eye. And of course, we're familiar with it in the dragonfly eye. All of those various lenses linking up with the brain that can understand, make of one, the 700 images that are being transmitted to its brain. Remember what Dwayne Gish said? He said that the fossil record is not a record of transformation of one type of creature into another. It is a record of mass destruction, death and burial by water and its contained sediments. And we, we've been around the world today because our planet is one massive burial ground you know, whether, you, whether you're in, in the Antarctic or, or you, you head up, the, 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 uh, the North Pole, of course, isn't land-based, but you can go to Spitsbergen, well within, the, uh, well within the Arctic Circle, and you find fossils there. The, the whole planet is a, a fossil graveyard. Dr. Richard Andre, a German scholar, in his book, German title there, one tried to pronounce it, he collected 88 different flood traditions from around the world. 88 different parts of the world. These tribes had, 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 in, their, had in, their, in their history a record of a flood. The Americas, Europe, the Africas, Australasia, and Asia itself, Europe, five flood stories, Africa, seven flood stories, Australasia, 10, Asia, 20, the Americas, 46. I think the Bible has the answer to this global graveyard. In Genesis chapter 6, so this is the first book in the Bible, we're only six chapters into it, but mankind had become so wicked in, in that time. The Lord says, behold, I bring a flood of waters on the earth to destroy all flesh under the heavens in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall expire. The next chapter, for in yet seven days I will cause it to rain on the earth forty days and forty nights. And every living being which I have made will I destroy from the ground. And in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day, were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. Now look carefully at this verse. The water wasn't just coming from above. The windows of heaven were opened. But notice the fountains of the deep. But notice all the fountains of the great deep were broken up. On Boxing Day 2004, the tectonic plates out east of India, they rubbed against each other and formed the, the Boxing Day tsunami quarter of a million people died. That was one fountain of the deep breaking up. But in the flood of Noah, it wasn't one. It was all the fountains of the great deep were broken up. And the windows of heaven were opened and it rained 40 days and 40 nights. So it couldn't rain 40 days and 40 nights uh, right now, I'm told. Uh, but as we shall see, as we shall see, things were different then see the lord jesus said in matthew 24 
And as were the days of Noah, so shall be the coming of the Son of Man. For as, as in those days, which were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. And so shall be the coming of the Son of Man. So the Lord Jesus is looking back to Noah and he's looking back at that event which came and took them all away. And he's comparing it to a future event for planet Earth. That is his own coming, his own return to planet Earth. But that return is to be returned to planet Earth in judgment. Now, six days of creation, and what is interesting is that day one, let there be light. The second day, he divided the waters from the waters. You've got land and plants, and the seed contained in them, sun, moon, and the stars, of course. And day five, sea and air creatures, land animals on day six uh, with Adam. And on day seven, God rested. Now, what was the overall verdict of that creation in six days? Very good. God saw everything he had made. Behold, it was very good. Now, here, it's interesting to note that after every day, we find this statement. God saw it was good. Every day except one. Let there be light, God saw it was good. The land and plants with the seed contained and the fruit thereof, good. Sea and air creatures, good. Land animals and Adam, good. But not day two. No, I, I don't think that's a, a, an omission, an error on God's part. You know, there's nothing, there's nothing slack or un unmeasured in the word of God. There has to be a reason why, unlike the other, the other uh, five days, God doesn't pronounce good. Why? Well, this is what happened on day two. He took water from the water and separated it. And he, and he, and, uh, he said, let there be a space between the waters. And so we have what many suggest is a water canopy over the earth. And perhaps the reason was he didn't pronounce it good on day two was that God in his foreknowledge, he knew that this water covering would come down in judgment in the days of Noah and deluge the earth as well as the water from the fountains of the deep. If that's the case, it wasn't a local flood, as some would suggest. It was a global flood. Cubism. In 1872, archaeologist George Smith was examining fragments of clay tablets at the British Museum. The clay tablets from 668, 627 BC, revealed, among other things, a Babylonian account of the flood story. And the dimensions of the ark are given. It was a cube. Be like going to see in a washing machine. Not very seaworthy. The Bible gives us the dimensions of the ark. 450 feet long, 45 feet high, and 75 feet wide. Now, you can see a relationship between the length and the height. The ratio is 10 to 1. It's 10 times longer than it's high. But there's also a relationship between the width and the length. You've got to be a little bit uh, better at maths to do this one, but the ratio is six to one. It's six times longer than it is wide. Now, you know, do, do, these, do these ratios, do these measurements make sense? 
would, would the naval architect would, would would he be impressed with these? Well, there's Isambard Kingdom Brunel. He built this boat, the SS Great Britain. You can actually see it in Bristol today, built in 1843. It was the world's first iron-hulled, screw-propeller-driven, steam-powered passenger liner. First screw-propeller-driven uh, uh, iron ship to cross the Atlantic. Dimensions were... Do you notice the, the measurement to the left, the length? To the one on the right, roughly 10 to 1. What about the middle one with the length? 51 feet to 322 feet, 6 to 1. Professor Henry Morridge, hydrogeology. He does these calculations and he says this, the arc's dimensions made it almost impossible to capsize. Even if tilted through any angle less than 90 degrees, the buoyant force tending to right it always acts outside the weight force tending to capsize it, thus causing it to return to its normal floating position. We've got to move on. Let's look at some population stats. From 1801 onwards, the lowest average population increase in Great Britain occurred between 1939 and 1951. Now, just by looking at those dates, you can work out why, why it was so low. It works out at an annual increase, population increase of 0.43%. So it's not even 1%, not even half a percent. And it was, it was low because of, of World War II the many deaths that occurred in World War II. The population in Great Britain in 1801 was 10 and a half million. By 1991, the population had grown to uh, 54 million, just a little bit more. This works out at an average yearly increase of 0.87%. That's twice as much as the, the figure above between 1939 and 1951. A verse from the Bible, it says, when the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing into which few, that is eight souls were saved through water. Eight souls saved. Only eight souls went onto the ark and then eight souls came off. And from those eight souls, they were told to repopulate the earth again. Bible chronology would tell me the flood happened 4,400 years ago. How many years would it take to get the present world population from eight people using the lowest and average growth rates as presented on the previous slide? You know, the 0.43% distorted by uh, the Second World War, of the average there, 0.86%. If we take the lowest, we could get the present world population 4,738 years. If we take the higher one, obviously it would take less time, 2,347 years. Interesting stats, but consider this. And th these facts are taken from a, a paper presented by the, or produced by the Creation Science Movement, Population Growth by Paul Nichols. The lowest recorded growth rate for Western Europe is 0.37%. So it's, it's even lower than the, uh, the stats of the Second World War. Let's say that man has been around for just uh, 50,000 years, you know, the, the, it's a conservative estimate this, you know, they would tell us quarter of a million years, but let's be very conservative and say 50,000 years. So what would the world population be 50,000 years? If man's been around for 50,000 years and we're going to take the lowest recorded growth rate for Western Europe at 0.377%, it would be... There's always a straggler. 
That's what the world population would be if man's been on the planet for 50,000 years. The present world population is roughly 7.8 billion. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to round that number up. And th that's the rounded up as the figure in the, in, in the, within the white uh, rectangle. But you see that purple zero that we've highlighted? That's, that would be 10 times that population. And, and if we go to this one here, th those zeros means that figure from the one to that final zero in purple, you know, that would be a million times the present world population. We're getting towards the end here. You've been very patient. That's a Chinese pictogram. It means a large boat. It's actually made up of three pictograms. Let's do, break them up into three bits. The first one means a boat. Number two means eight. And number three is a mouth. A boat with eight mouths. When the Chinese talk of people, they use an expression which literally means man mouth. As we count heads, they count mouths. So the symbol, those three symbols combined may mean a large boat or just a boat with eight people in it. Coincidence? We're told in the Bible that God spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. That's a good Bible word, eh? Saved. Ungodly. God's hatred of man's wickedness must, must be judged. But he, he had a willingness to save. And Noah was a preacher. Peter would tell us again, when the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few that is eight souls was saved by water. I think that uh, uh, that's a, a lovely expression. You know, God is eternal. T time is immaterial to him. And yet we have the statement here, the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved by water. Now, in the first scripture that was quoted there, we are told he was a preacher of righteousness. We are not told what he preached, but if you allow me some license, I think he preached this message. The judgment is coming. God hates your sin and your wickedness. He wants you to turn from it. He offers you a place in this vessel that I am building. But if you're going to come into it, you can only come one way. There's only one door. And that's true, there was only one door in the ark. It reminds me of something Jesus said. He said, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved. And of course, he died on the cross for our sins. Was buried and after three days rose again. I think there's only a couple more slides here. Another pictogram from China. There's a pictogram that means lamb. And there's another pictogram that just means me. And what the Chinese do, they put them both together and they put me under the lamb. So you've got the pictogram for lamb and you've got the pictogram for me. Put them together just means me under the lamb and it makes a brand new word. Brand new word. Well, we need to understand the lamb first. You know, John the Baptist one day, according to John's gospel, when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming to him, he said, behold, the lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. He was pointing to Jesus. He identified him as the lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world. And the brand new word is righteous. Isn't that wonderful? 
anyone who was prepared to put themselves under God's lamb, Jesus Christ, his death, his sacrifice for our sins, God will declare that person righteous. Could I just take you back before we get to the last slide? Could I just take you back to the 2004 tsunami? It took almost a quarter of a million lives. One of the strange phenomena of the tsunami is that in several places, before the tidal wave came, it came in, the sea actually receded, it went out. In some places, over a mile out. And people went down on the sand to investigate the strange phen phenomena, the sea receding. And of course, they went down onto the beach and there were stranded fish. And they were picking up the fish. They couldn't believe their good fortune. And they were saying to themselves, my, it's a lovely sunny day. We've got free food here for days. Unaware that the water that receded would soon be coming in at the height of coconut trees. And I think that's what people are doing today. They're basking in the sunshine. Mind you, the coronavirus isn't much sunshine, but they're picking up the fish and they're saying, oh, we like the glitter and the tinsel of this passing world. Unaware that the tsunami of God's judgment is going to fall on planet Earth when Jesus Christ returns. The last slide. That he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Last week we were preaching in a, a town centre in the northeast of England and uh, I met three very nice young Muslim boys. And they said to me that if God was all powerful, he would just be able to forgive sin just like that. Well, Sin is serious. Sin must be punished. God just can't lift the carpet and sweep our sin underneath it. It must be dealt with in a righteous way. And I like this verse from the book of Romans. The apostle Paul says that he, God, might be just, righteous, and the justifier of him or her, who believes in Jesus. So any man or woman, boy or girl, who will believe that when Jesus died on that cross, he died for their sins. And God will take the person who believes that and he will put them before him in a righteous standing. God is the justifier of him or her who believes in Jesus. And so I finish with these words. There's the cross, he died upon it. And there's the tomb that they suggest he was buried in, which after three days he came back to life. He's not here, he is risen. You know, the resurrection of Jesus Christ marks out Christianity as being unique. It's the only resurrection, it's the only, sorry, it's the only, it's the only faith that can speak of a man who died for, for sins, that offers a saviour but it's the only one that can boast about a man who has conquered death. Well, I'm going to finish there. You've been very patient. That's an hour and 20 minutes at least. So thank you so much for listening. But that's the end. <laughs>